أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألهاكم التكاثر حتى زرتم المقابز كلا سوف تعلمون ثم كلا سوف تعلمون كلا لو تعلمون علم اليقين لترون الجحيم ثم لترونها عين اليقين ثم لتسألن يومئذ عن بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله I have just recited to you a surah which I believe that all of you know and memorize and recite regularly in your prayers. And this is Surah At-Takathur. And Surah At-Takathur is a very early Meccan Surah, which means it was revealed early on in the message or the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now these early revelations, they are characterized by different characteristics than the later revelations. This is because the Muslims in Mecca were very different, their situation from the Muslims in Medina. The Muslims in Mecca were being persecuted. They did not have an Islamic state. They did not have the protection of the government. Likewise, none of the laws had been revealed. All of the laws or most of the laws had been revealed in Medina. So Meccan surahs, especially these early Meccan surahs, they are characterized by a discussion of the fundamentals of faith, the fundamentals of aqidah, the basis of morality, establishing the taqwa of Allah Azza wa Jal, reminding the people of the hereafter. Also, Makkan surahs in general are very short in their verses, powerful language is being used, far more powerful, and uh, the rhetoric and the eloquence, it is much higher than that of the uh, Madani revelations. The Madani revelations are usually longer, and they deal with the laws more than they deal with aqidah. So Surah At-Takathur, as we said, is an early Meccan Surah according to the stronger of the two opinions. Allah Azza wa Jal says, Alhaakumu At-Takathur. Okay, now this lecture will be a tafsir of the Surah, which means that we have to go into the Arabic language, which means that you must pay attention because we're going to talk about fact or, or linguistic details which will not be apparent unless you pay attention uh, very deeply. Alhaakumu At-Takathur. There are two words here. Alhaakum and At-Takathur. The easier of the two to deal with is takathur, from kathra. Everyone knows what kathir means, kathra, means a lot, okay? Takathur means competing with one another to see who has more. From kathra meaning a lot. So takathur means you are competing with each other to see who has more than the other person. So Allah Azza wa is saying, alhaakum, this concept of competing with one another. What does it mean alhaakum? Al-Hakum comes from the root Al-Lahu, which means, Lahu means that which keeps you busy from something which is more important and useful. This is the meaning of Lahu. Now Allah says in many verses in the Quran that this world is Lahun wa La'ib. It is a Lahu and a La'ib. Many verses, at least five, six verses, Allah says, know that this world is only Lahu and La'ib. What is the difference between Lahu and La'ib? Lahu means you are doing something which might be useful, but at the expense of something which is more useful than this. Very precise word here. This is in contrast to la'ib, which means to play, to be merry. You're wasting your time, you're not doing anything useful at all. So notice now to translate this verse, Allah Azza wa Jal is saying that competing with one another to see who has more than the other, this has caused you to fall into wasting your time at the expense of something more important than it. This is the translation of Al-Hakum al 
that in competing with one another to see who has more money, the bigger house, the better car, the more beautiful spouse, who has the more prestige, this is what most of mankind is doing. Trying to climb up the social ladder through various ways. Allah Azza wa Jalla is reminding us that this concept has caused you to neglect a greater concept. This is the meaning of lahu, remember. Al-Hakum. It has caused you to forget about something more important than what you are doing. Notice Allah uses the word lahu and not la'i. What you are doing might be useful. In fact, it might be necessary. In terms of getting your job, getting some money, feeding your family. Allah didn't say la'ib, He used the word lahu. Remember, what was the difference between la'ib and lahu? La'ib means you're wasting your time, no benefit, playing. Lahu means you're doing something, it might be important, but you're neglecting something more important than that, than, than what you are doing. So Allah Azza wa is saying that by competing with one another, in this takathur, we have forgotten something more important than that. This competing with one another has prevented us from realizing a greater goal, from achieving something which is more important than what we are doing. What is this important goal? Obviously, it is the worship of Allah It is the, to, the striving to arrive at the ultimate destination which is Jannah. So Allah is reminding us that all of us or the majority of us are so engrossed in this world we have forgotten the real world of the hereafter. We are so busy trying to live and enjoying our life that we forget that this life is really nothing compared to the life of the hereafter. These 60, 70, 80, 90 years that Allah might bless us with and we, don't even, we can't even guarantee this number. It is nothing in comparison to the infinity of the hereafter. And yet despite this fact, we have our priorities wrong. Allah is saying you are engrossed in these 60 years to make the best of your life. And in the process you have forgotten the eternal life of the hereafter. Al-Hakum al But how long will this last? When will we realize, as they say, wake up and smell the coffee? When will this happen? Hatta zurtum al You will continue to be engrossed in this world. Or the most of you, the majority of you. You will continue to compete with one another. Be so busy in your life, in your job, in your degrees, in your family, everything, until you visit the graves. Until you visit the graves. What is the meaning of visiting the graves here? It means, many people assume this means you go visit the grave and you come back. Right? Because this is what the verbal translation is. You go visit the grave. All of us, whenever some of us, uh, whenever one of our relatives, family, friends die, we visit the grave and we come back. And this is something, as we know, it is encouraged. The Prophet ﷺ said, I used to forbid you from visiting the graves, now I encourage you to do so because it reminds you of the hereafter. But this is not the meaning of this verse. If you go back to the scholars of tafsir and their explanation of this verse, you find that the meaning of this verse is you will continually be engrossed in competing with one another and seeing who has the more than the other until you die. And Allah calls death visiting the graves. Notice the beauty here. Even death is a visitation. It is not permanent. In other words, Allah is reminding you of a stage beyond death. By saying when you visit the graves, Allah is reminding you, you will die. All of us will die. Allah says in the Quran, Afa in mitta fahumul khalidun. He is addressing the Prophet. ﷺ. If you are going to die, do they think they will live forever? If the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is and has died, as Allah says in the Quran, Afa in mitta, you are going to die. Afa humul khalidun, will they live forever then? Of course not. All of us are going to die. But Allah is saying by visiting the graves, He is reminding us that even this death is not a permanent state. Don't think that when you die, you have arrived at your destination. On the contrary, the Prophet sallallahu said that death is the first stage of the hereafter. The first stage. So even death is not a destination. And that is why death has been called visiting the graves. Just like we, as we are alive, enter a graveyard, we bury our relatives and friends and we walk out again. So too, when we are carried on other people's shoulders and dirt is thrown onto our faces and bodies by our own family and friends, this too is a visitation. 
This too is a temporary abode, a temporary place of residence, such that eventually we are going to leave this grave as well. So Allah Azza wa Jalla in this beautiful verse, He says, He reminds us, not only are you going to die, but this death is not going to be permanent. This death will be a temporary position until the hereafter comes. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, one of the famous uh, students of the companions and the great great grandson of, of, of Umar ibn Khattab, he said, the graves are only a place of visiting. Eventually a person must return to his permanent house, meaning in Jannah or in Naam. Even the graves are a temporary stop. Eventually a person must be reunited with his permanent house. The house that Allah has created for him, either in Jannah inshallah or the place of punishment, the fire of hell, we seek Allah's refuge from that. Also in this verse there is a reference to the punishment of the grave. Because even the grave will either be a reward or a punishment. Even the grave will either be a reward or a punishment. The Prophet ﷺ said that when the person is put in the grave, then if he be from the, from the people of Jannah, Allah will open up a window to Jannah. And he will see what is awaiting him. He will see his palace. He will see what Allah has created for him. And he will be able to smell Jannah. At the same time, he will be able to see the fire of hell and that Allah has saved him from it. So he will say, Oh Allah, hurry up the day of judgment. I want it to come quickly. As for the kafir or the disbeliever or the evil person, then he will, the doors of hell will be opened up and he will be able to taste and smell the punishment. And he will see the punishment awaiting him. And he will also see the place he would have occupied in Jannah had he been a good person. So he will say, Oh Allah, never establish the day of judgment. Oh Allah, postpone it to infinity. So even in the grave, there will be a punishment or a reward which will be a taste, a reflection of what is to come in the hereafter. So, Allah Azza wa is telling us in the surah, you are going to compete with one another throughout your lives, trying to see who has the more. And this will go on until you die. Hatta zurtumul maqabir. Kalla. No. Nay. This is a word that is used to negate what has preceded. To negate what has come before it and to draw attention. So Allah Azza wa is saying that basically, Kalla. All of your takathur, all of your competing with one another will be of no use to you. All of the money and all of the wealth and status and fame and privilege and all that you had. Kalla, what's the point? It's not going to benefit you in the grave. Like the Prophet ﷺ said, that when a person goes to the grave, three things come with him. Two come back and only one remain. When he goes into the grave, he has his wealth and children and good deeds. And when he leaves, then his wealth and children go back and his only his good and bad deeds remain with him. So all of this kalla, what is the point? Why do you engross yourself in that which will not be permanent? سَوْفَ تَعْلَمُونَ You are going to know. What are you going to know? The result of this takathur. The result of spending your lives, wasting it in lahu, in something which is of not much use at the expense of the real life of the hereafter. Of a surety you are going to know the foolishness of your actions. Every single one of us, without exception, will regret on the day of judgment why he didn't do more. Even if we are going to Jannah, inshallah, we pray that Allah will make us amongst them. Even then we will regret. Why didn't I do more? I could have done better. I could have gotten a higher place. And of course, those who are going to be destined to the fire of hell, they will cry out, Oh Allah, give me one more chance. Wait. Send me back to this earth. Allow me one opportunity and you will see what I will do for you. Allah says, even if I were to give you this, as in the Quran, even though He will not, Allah says, even if I were to give you, you would still return to your ways. You would still be what you have done. The point being that Allah promises that you are going to know. Kalla sawfa ta'lamun. Thumma kalla, once again, repetition. There's a repetition here. Thumma kalla sawfa ta'lamun. And this repetition, it signifies a number of things. Firstly, an extreme warning. Like the parent says to his child, I have told you once and I'm telling you again. It's an extreme warning. Think, ponder. Another connotation. You will know in this world the foolishness of these actions and you will also know in the hereafter. In this world you will know after you have gained all that you have gained and you realize that you still have not found the happiness of the heart. All of your riches cannot bring you the contentment 
of worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal. So you will know in this world the foolishness of this takathur and you will also know in the hereafter. That's one meaning of repetition. Another meaning of this repetition is that the kuffar will know the foolishness of their actions and so will the Muslims and they will be overjoyed at the fact that they took advantage of this life. So you the kuffar will know kalla sofa ta'alamun thumma kalla you the Muslims you will also know. You will know the evil that you have done and you will know the good that you will be rewarded for. Yet another connotation of the dual or the, or the, uh, the, the two times that Allah mentions thumma kalla sofa ta'alamun is that you will know at the time of your death. Because when death will come to you, right then and there you will know your, your, your place in Jannah or not. The Prophet ﷺ said that when the evil person, when the, when the munafiq or the kafir or the fasiq, actually the word is used, the evil person, which is broader than a kafir, a Muslim can be a fasiq, but a Muslim cannot be a kafir. So Allah says the fasiq, the evil person, who might be a Muslim, when death comes to him, he will see the angel of punishment come down who is a horrendous angel, an angel that when you see it, you will be struck with fear. And whatever he sees, he will see all around him the angels of punishment. While he is alive, he will see this, the final seconds of his life. And they will start punishing him at the time of taking his soul. And the Prophet ﷺ described his soul coming out of his body. And notice this, this powerful imagery. He said, as wet wool is pulled through a comb, Wet will pull through a comb. Can you imagine how it will tear, break? Nothing will be left of the wool. You have to pull the comb out of it. So too will his soul be taken out of his body. Why? Because he loved the dunya so much that when his soul is about to leave it, it will destroy it completely. His soul was attached to the dunya. So when he leaves it, he will not leave it easily. As for the mu'min, the Prophet ﷺ described that he will come out like this, like water being poured from a cup out like this. Smoothly. Because his heart was attached to what? It was not attached to the dunya, it was attached to the akhirah. So because of this, his soul will flow out of his body. And he will see the angels of mercy all around him. Bright, shining, radiant. So right then and there, he will know the reality of his life. If he had done good, he will see the good. And if he had done bad, he will see the bad. Yet another connotation, the final one that the scholars give, is that you will know meaning in the grave. And then you will know again meaning in the hereafter. And we have already explained this, that in the grave, in the grave, a person gets a taste of what is to follow. If he was a pious person, having performed what Allah wanted him to do as a Muslim, then he will taste the rewards of that in the grave. And the converse is also true. And it is possible that two people are buried next to each other. Literally one feet or two feet away from each other. And one of them is in the heights of Jannah, enjoying the heights of Jannah. And the one right next to him is being punished in the depths of hell. And this is of the miraculous nature of the barzakh or that internal uh, stage between death and the day of judgment. Kalla sofa ta'alamun, thumma kalla sofa ta'alamun. I have explained five or six reasons why there is a repetition. Kalla, for the third time Allah says in this verse. Once again, repeated for the third time. Each time there is a diff different clause and warning. Law ta'alamuna ilm al yaqeen. If you knew with certain knowledge, ilm al yaqeen meaning certain knowledge. If you knew what, it is not mentioned. What would you do? Silence. The, the verse doesn't tell you. So the verse, when you read it for the first time, it seems incomplete. But we understand by context. If you knew, meaning the reality of life, the purpose of creation, if you knew the futility of takathur, of competing with one another, but what type of knowledge? All of us know this, even the kafir, even the disbeliever, he can deny Allah with his tongue. He can deny the day of judgment. He can deny the Prophet Sallallahu He can deny the validity of the Quran. But even he cannot deny death. No one can deny death. <coughs> Nobody. So even the Kafir realizes that all of this that he has to leave, that he has, will leave him. Will go into the hands of other people. So Allah doesn't just say, if you knew. He characterizes this knowledge. If you knew with a certain knowledge. Ilm al yaqeen not any knowledge. Everyone knows we're going to die. Nobody claims we're going to live forever. But there are those who believe it and don't act upon it. And there are those who believe it and then act upon it. 
So if you knew with a certain knowledge, a knowledge that will bring about action, will bring about Iman, what would you do? It is not mentioned. The verse does not tell you. So the verse translates as, Verily, if you knew with a certain knowledge, and then it doesn't tell you what you would do. Meaning that, if you really and truly knew with a certain knowledge, you would do many things. Okay, so Allah does not mention the result of this clause in order for our imagination to go the furthest. Let me give an example. A father punishes his child and he says, next time you do this, I am going to do something to you. And he remains silent. He doesn't say what. This will terrify the child more than if the father says, next time you do, I'm going to hit you. Because the imagination jumps at everything. What's he going to do? Same thing Allah is saying, if you only knew with a certain knowledge, and then he doesn't say what you would do. In order that our imagination goes to the extreme, you would do everything possible to enter Jannah and save yourself from the fire of hell. You would bend over backwards, literally, if you had to, in order to save yourselves from that punishment and earn the rewards of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah doesn't give us the condition to this clause in order that our imagination go everywhere, go to the extremes, that you would do everything that you have to in order to Save yourselves from the punishment of the hereafter and the punishment of the fire of hell. Then Allah starts a new sentence. Now here, basically it's very advanced Arabic, but basically there's a hidden um, oath. Wallahi, I swear by Allah. La of a certainty. The noon there is again emphasis. Point being, in English we cannot translate this, but there are three ways of emphasizing the fact that you are going to see the fire of hell. Now if we were translated linguistically, it would say, I swear by Allah, indeed, surely, verily, three times, three emphasis. The Arabic language allows this beauty. The English is very dry compared to Arabic, to be honest. Obviously, Arabic is the most eloquent language, uh, and that is why the Quran was revealed in it. So there are three emphasis, and there's a hidden oath as well. That you will of a certainty, surely, verily, all of you are going to see the fire of hell. The lamb and the noon, at the beginning and the end. And the hidden oath, these are three emphasis that are in this verse. That each and every single person will see the fire of hell. And we all know that the fire of hell will be shown to all of mankind. The Prophet ﷺ said that the fire of hell... As Allah says in Surah Al-Fajr, وَجَاءَ رَبُّكَ وَرْمَلَكُ صَفًّا صَفًّا وَجِيءَ يَوْمَ إِذٍ بِجَهَنَّمْ Your Lord and the angels will come in ranks and rows, and hell will be brought forth on that day. The Prophet ﷺ said, there will be 70,000 chains that hell will be dragged upon. 70,000 chains will be used, and on each of these one chains will be 70,000 angels dragging hell. So all of us are going to see the fire of hell. We seek Allah's refuge from entering it. So لَتَرَوُنَّ الْجَحِيمِ Then Allah Azza wa Jal says, ثُمَّ لَتَرَوُنَّهَا عَيْنَ الْيَقِينِ Then you are going to see it with the eye of certainty. Now once again there is a duality. There is twice. You are going to see the fire of hell. Then you will see it with the eye of reality. What is the meaning of this, of this double image or double message? Once again, there's a number of opinions. Firstly, you will see it from far away. And then you will see it up close. Secondly, you will see it, the kuffar will see it from outside. And then they will be see it from inside. Thirdly, that you will see it. And then you will see it again and again and again, continuously. As we said in the, in the grave, both the mu'min and the fajr, they will see the fire of hell, but the mu'min will be protected from it. He will not taste it or feel it or smell it, and he will know that Allah has saved him from it. And the kafir or the fasiq, the evil person, he will feel the heat of the fire of hell even while he is in the grave. So Allah Azza wa Jal says that you are going to see the fire of hell. Some ulama say that the reference to the first one is that you will see it, meaning an image of it as Allah has described it in the Quran. We all know some of the punishments of the fire of hell. And then you will see it with the real eye on the day of judgment. So the first, uh, the first one, الجحيم, you will see it in knowledge basically. اليقين, you will see it with your own eyes. Then on that day, on that day, meaning the day of judgment when hellfire will be brought forth, so that all of you can see it. 
On that day, لَتُسْأَلُنَّ Once again, there's an emphasis here. This of the beauty of the Arabic language. You can emphasize in many different ways. Of a certainty, you will be asked about what? About Naim. Naim meaning the plural of Ni'ma. Ni'ma meaning blessing. So, you will be asked about each and every blessing that Allah Azza wa Jal has given you. On that day, Allah will ask you, did I give you a life? Did I bless you with health? Did I give you an intellect? Did I cause you to become what you became? Your money, your status, your wives and children, your property, your health, your mental capabilities and faculties. Who gave it to you all? What did you do with it? What did you do with what I gave you? You will be asked about each and every single blessing that Allah Azza wa Jal blessed you with. A poor person came to one of the scholars of the past. And he was very poor. And he said, what na'im do we have? What blessings do we have? When we're eating the two black things. What are the two black things? Dates and muddy water. They didn't even have clean water like this. I doubt that many of the Sahaba even saw water like this because their water was drawn from a well, muddy water. And the other black thing is dates. They would live just on dates and water. As for us, after fasting, we start our meal. This is our appetizers, date and water. For them, this was their food, dates and water. So he asked the scholar, what na'im do we have when all we eat and drink are the two black things, the, the, the dates and water? The scholar said, do you not drink cold water on a hot day? Do you not have a blanket to cover yourself with? Do you not go to sleep and wake up refreshed? In other words, even the worst beggar, the most poorest person, has been blessed with so many blessings he cannot count them. As Allah says in the Quran, Wa in ta'uddu ni'mat Allah, the same word ni'mah from Naim. وَإِن تَعُدُّ نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْسُوهَا If you were to try to count, only count, not even thank, just count the blessings of Allah, you would not be able to finish this list. Just count them. Allah has given me this and this and this and this and this. If you were to spend a lifetime just counting the blessings, you would not be able to merely count them. How do you expect to thank Allah Azza wa Jal the way He deserves to be thanked? Yet another person came to Al-Hasan al-Basri, famous scholar of the past. And he said, Oh Hassan al-Basri, I'm very poor. I don't have anything. <coughs> Make dua for me, help me out, give me something. Al-Hasan al-Basri said to him, Okay, I'll give you a million pounds, a million gold coins. But in return, you give me your eyesight. Give me your eyes in return. He said, I'm not going to do that. He said, okay, give me your hands. I'm not going to do that. Your feet, your body, anything, give it to me. I'm not going to do that. So Al-Hasan al-Basri said, I see that you're a millionaire. And you come and you complain that you have no money. You're a multi-millionaire, you have everything. You're not willing to give me one eye for a million pounds, a million dollars, a million gold coins. And you come and you complain that you don't have one or two silver coins for food and bread. You are a walking sign of Allah's blessings upon you. The very fact that you are alive, you are breathing air, you are a believer. Can anything of money buy this? Nothing of this whole world can buy this from you. The fact that you believe in Allah and you worship Him insha'Allah and you are blessed with life and health and wealth and everything. So never trivialize the blessings of Allah upon you. Wallahi, it is a sign of Iman to think that you, every one of you is the most blessed human being on the face of this earth. And it is also a sign of Iman to think that you are the worst human being in terms of repaying Allah's debt upon you. You are the best in what Allah has given you. Ponder over it. The blessings Allah has given you of your family background and your life and your status and your, and your parents and your wife and your children and your job and your intellect and all that you have done. Every one of us should feel it is a sign of Iman. No one is as blessed as I am sitting here today. Every one of us should feel that. At the same time, we should feel no one is worse than I in terms of repaying that debt to Allah. When these two emotions are combined, inshallah, we are upon some good. When these two emotions are combined, really and truly combined, we really and truly feel guilty. 
We feel, what have I done? How have I repaid Allah's debt? What will I say to Allah on the Day of Judgment that He has given me so many things? When we feel this guilt along with gratitude at what Allah has given us, this is a stepping stone. This is not the destination. It can't be the destination. It is followed up in action. This is the stepping stone, the foundation upon which we build our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My dear brothers and sisters, can you imagine you enter into college or university and the first day of class, the professor tells you, okay, instead of teaching you, I will tell you right now what questions I will ask you at the end of the exam. When the exam time comes, I'll tell you, from now I'll tell you. Question number one, he writes it on the board. Question two, question three, question four, question five. These are your exam questions. Now, is it possible, really, that any student will fail this exam? First day of class, teacher comes and doesn't even start the topic. And he says, these are your questions. If you pass them, you get an A or a B or a C, whatever, depending on your exam, your responses. Yet, how few of us realize that this is exactly what Allah has done? Exactly. He has told us the questions that will be asked to us on the Day of Judgment. Verbatim, literally. He has told us the questions that the angels will ask us Munkan Nakil in the grave. We have the cheat sheet with us. Allah has given it to us. What more can we possibly ask for, my dear brothers and sisters? Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Quran that the feet of the son of Adam will not move. Excuse me, not in the Quran. This is a hadith. The feet of the son of Adam will not move on the day of judgment until he is asked five questions. Here are the questions. Know them, memorize them. But the issue is, my dear brothers and sisters, the response, and this is the key, will not be verbal. The response will be in deed, in actions. The response, it will not be sufficient merely to say, it must be shown, it must be proven. What are these five questions? The Prophet ﷺ said that the first one is that he will be asked about his life and how he spent it. What did you do with the life that I gave you? All of these years that you had on this earth, what have you accomplished in it that is worthy to be shown to me today? And don't tell me you became an engineer or this or that. Even the kuffar did that. What have you done to thank me for this life that I gave you? The second question regarding his youth and what he spent it in. Youth. So he's asked about his entire life and then a special segment of his life will be called for closer, closer scrutiny because this is the segment of your life where you are the most responsible and sadly, frankly, the most irresponsible as well. The reality is that you should be the most responsible. But when you look around you, you find that generally at this age, youth are the most irresponsible. Why should you be the most responsible? Because you are at the prime of your energy, your enthusiasm, your zeal. No one can beat you. By the way, what is the definition of a youth? Don't think of only a teenager. Yes, of course, your youth starts here. But the, the term shabab or shab in Arabic, scholars differ, does it finish at 30 or 35? But it's not the teenagers only. From, let's say, 14, 15, until 30 to 35, these 20 years, they are the foundations upon which a person plans his life out. Okay, I'm going to become a doctor, an engineer, a scientist, a technician, a teacher. I'm going to get married at this age. I want to do this. This is my aims and goals. His enthusiasm, his zeal, his zealousness reaches an all-time high. If he has to change fields, he'll change fields. A person who's 50, he's not going to change his field. If he's a doctor, he's not going to become an engineer. If he's an engineer, he's not going to become a scientist. It's too late. But a person who's 20, 25, he loses his job. He has to change degrees. No problem. He'll go back to school again. He has that determination, that dedication to do what it takes. Likewise, physically, physically, his strength, the power that a person has is at his peak. He gets stronger and stronger in his 20s until around 30, 33. This is when the decline starts, the physical decline. Also, his beauty or her beauty. A person is most handsome and a woman is most beautiful during these ages. 
And that is why all of us, insha'Allah, will enter Jannah. Allah, the Prophet said they will enter and their age will be, how old? 33. 33. All of the people who enter Jannah, they will be 33 years old. That will be their, uh, their, their the, the looks or the age will be around 33. Because this is the prime. So even physically, emotionally, psychologically, mentally, we are at our prime in this age. So Allah Azza wa Jal will ask us specifically about this age. What have you done? It is very easy to be a practicing Muslim. When you're 80, 70 years old, you have nothing else to do. Very easy. But were you a practicing Muslim in your youth? When you're at your prime, you could do so many things. The fitan, the shahawat of this world were calling you. The women, the wine, the drugs, the alcohol, the money. This is when you want to spend it. When you're around 50, 60, many people don't even have these desires anymore. They've passed it. So Allah will specialize this particular life or this particular period. Were you able to control your passions? Did you live a pious life when you were a shabab or a shabba, a young or a male or a man or woman? Were you able to control yourself? Did you have Islamic ideals? In one narration is reported that the Prophet ﷺ said that Allah Azza wa Jal is amazed, is pleased with a shab, with a young man who does not deviate into sins. Allah loves it. Allah loves it because this is when really deviation primarily occurs. As all of us who are parents very well know. When does the problems really start with your children? When they hit the teenage years. When the hormones start kicking in. When they start becoming adults. This is when the real problem starts. And if you give your children a proper tarbiyah, a proper education, from day one, then inshallah expect the best. But if you haven't, then don't come running and crying when they turn 17, 18, and they run away with their girlfriends or their boyfriends, and they become non-Muslims. A'udhu Billah. How many are the parents that have come to me personally? Wallahi, with tears running down their faces. My son has become a kafir. My girl has run away with a non-Muslim boy. Even a Muslim boy if she ran away, a'udhu billah. But even, it hurts even more. She's run away with a non-Muslim boy. Do something. What are you doing coming to me after having spent 20, 30 years doing nothing for your own child? What can I possibly do for you? What can any Imam or Mulvi do for you? What have you done to raise your kids? You didn't care about their, their Salah. You didn't care about their Islam. You didn't care at all about their, their Deen. As for their dunya, you had plotted it from day one. My son will go to Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, whatever the universities might be here. He will become an engineer, doctor from day one. He will go to the best of all schools. That's all fine and dandy. No one's saying don't do that. But where is Islam? Where is Allah Azza wa Jal? Where is the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? As you reap, so shall you sow. What you plant, that is what is going to come out. So Allah Azza wa Jal will specify this age out of the five questions that is returned to the hadith. The first question was, He will ask you about your life and how you spent it. The second, He will ask you specifically out of your life of your shabab, of your youthfulness and what you used it in. The third, He will ask you about your money. How did you earn it? How did you earn your money? Was it halal or was it haram? What did you become? What did you do for a living? And while you were working, did you lie and cheat and steal and embezzle? Or were you honest, upright? And realize that haram earnings only bring about pain and discomfort and grief. Even if a person has millions and millions of pounds, if he has earned it through haram, wallahi his heart, his heart will be on fire. He will be living in hell as they say. He will not be able to enjoy these blessings. And the mu'min, even if he only has a few hundred pounds, he's getting a week or a month, living a modest life, his heart will be at peace, at comfort. He will feel the tranquility. He will enjoy this life because it is halal money. So Allah Azza wa will ask us, where did you get this money from? This is the third of the five questions. The fourth, what did you spend it on? So notice two questions regarding time. One of them, your entire life. The second one, your shabab, your youth. Two questions regarding money. How did you earn money? And then what did you spend your money on? Did you spend it on haram? Did you enjoy the world, the life of this world and forget your obligation for the hereafter? Or did you spend it on matters that will bring you closer to Allah Did you give your zakah? 
The Prophet ﷺ said that he who does not give his zakah, that on the day of judgment, that very money will be used to punish him. That very money will be used as a punishment for him. And it will last the entire length of the day of judgment, 50,000 years. So if he, did, he had camels, for example, and he did not give zakah, then the camels will be used to trample over him. His entire flock of camels will be taken over him, all over and over and over again until the day of judgment. Likewise, Allah describes in the Quran that those who do not give zakah, their, their gold and silver will be transformed into snakes and they'll be used to burn them in the fire of hell. What did you spend your money on? Now the bare minimum is zakah, but there is no limit. The more we give it is better for us. There are so many other projects that we can do of feeding the poor, of helping out orphans, of, of building masjids, spreading Islam for the sake of da'wah. Many, many projects that we can do. And there is no limit to this. The minimum is, as we said, zakat. And the zakat is on, this is a fiqh topic, is on four items and how to give zakat. Inshallah, there are plenty of books out there. This is the bare minimum. But the more we do, it is better for us. As Allah says in the Quran, whatever good that you spend, it is for your own self. Allah does not benefit from it. And one of the best things to spend our money on is sadaqa jariyah, is a continual charity. In other words, if you give a, 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 a poor person five pounds to eat, he'll eat it and he'll finish. But if you spend this money in building a masjid, or in you know, giving out Qur'ans for free for Muslims to read, or in giving out literature and one of the people is guided to Islam, then your money has been put to good use. It's an investment. It's an investment with Allah Azza wa Jal. So it's a continual charity, recurring charity. This is of the best ways to spend your money in that you do something which is a permanent value. Now obviously this doesn't mean that you neglect the other things. You still have to do things which are short term. This is a part of our, our, our belief as well. But this is the best way to spend your money is to spend it on sadaqa jariyah. And the fifth of the five questions is how much did you act upon what you knew? All of us have some knowledge of Islam. We all know we have to pray, we have to fast, we have to give zakah. We all know that it is haram to, to fornicate, to take drugs and alcohol, to, to leave the prayers, to lie, to cheat. How much did you act upon this knowledge? Did you just learn and then forget about it? Or did you learn and then act upon it? And notice the question is, how much did you act upon what you know? Because obviously, if we don't know something, then Allah will not call us to account for it. However, many people misunderstand this hadith and they say, this is a discouragement to learn Islam. This is not true. The encouragement of learning is found in many, many hadith and many, many hadith, uh, uh, ayat of the Quran. The point being though that when you don't know something and you did not have the opportunity to learn it, then and only then will it be forgiven upon you. If you didn't know something, but you had opportunity to learn or to ask, then you will not be held, uh, or you will be held accountable for that. It is obligatory on every single Muslim to ask the people of knowledge when he does not know. So the doctor must ask the alim about his profession. Am I allowed to do this? Am I not allowed to do that? Is this halal? Is this haram? The, the technician, the economist, the teacher, every single person, when he is faced with a scenario and he's not sure, he must go to the alim and ask him, am I allowed to do this or not? If he doesn't, he cannot come on the day of judgment and say, oh, I didn't know, Ya Allah, this was haram. Why didn't you know? What prevented you from knowing? How much do we study for our degrees? How, how much do we read these textbooks? You know, I'm not, I, I myself have a degree, as you know. Sometimes I look at these textbooks of engineering and, and, and chemistry and whatnot, and I wonder, did I actually read this cover to cover? I memorized this? It's scary. How much you have spent using your brain cells, your time, to go over so many books. And yet when it comes to Islam, you say, oh, I didn't have the time to ask, I didn't know. SubhanAllah, my dear brothers and sisters. Look at what you did for the dunya, and look at what you have done for Islam. Look at how much you have memorized, whether it be in chemistry, physics, biology, mathematics, engineering, medicine, the minutiae you go into. It is amazing, it is a miracle, really. It is a sign of Allah's creation that we can actually do this. And yet when it comes to Islam, oh, I, I didn't bother to ask, is this haram or halal? Never occurred to me. Why not? For your dunya, 
for your salary, for your job, for your degree, we have all seen how much we study. We have all seen how many years we spend. And yet for the sake of Islam, you can't even go to the masjid and ask an alim. You can't even pick up the phone and call. You can't even read and research yourself. Don't give excuses in front of Allah. Allah knows us. Allah knows our background. Allah knows our capabilities. So don't use this as an excuse not to learn. No. Because realize, as we said, obviously knowledge in and of itself is blessed and holy. And the more you learn, the higher you will be in Allah's sight. But even the one who did not know, this is not an excuse for him to say, oh, I didn't know, so therefore I went into haram. He must ask. Allah says in the Quran, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of knowledge if you don't know. If you don't know, ask. Don't just assume. Don't just go on with your life. So these are the five questions that the Prophet ﷺ has told us will be asked on the Day of Judgment. We know the questions. We know the exam. How much have we prepared for it, my dear brothers and sisters? Let me conclude this talk by quoting you a very beautiful hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Where the Prophet ﷺ did not have food to eat in the daytime. And so he was so hungry, he did not want to sit in his house because it will just make you think more. So he just exited his house, went outside. And in those days, this is something that we won't even know or have heard of, when you did not have any food, you would tie a stone to your belly because psychologically, you would think that you had some food. It would make the pangs of hunger go down. You would tie a stone to your belly. He went outside and he saw Umar ibn al-Khattab sitting there. So he said, what are you doing outside, O oh, Umar? Umar lifted his shirt and there was a stone there, which meant that he didn't have any food. So the Prophet ﷺ lifted his shirt and there were two stones there. Okay. So one of the companions happened to be there. And he said, and he went home to his wife, running. And he said, I cannot bear what I have just seen. Do we have anything in the house? Anything? She said, all we have is that old goat or, or, or sheep. That's all we have. We have nothing else. He said, sacrifice it. Kill it. Cook the meat. And I'm going to call the Prophet ﷺ to partake of it. I cannot bear to see him in this state. So he went to the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ called Abu Bakr and Umar who were in the same situation as him. You know, and subhanAllah, my dear brothers and sisters, Wallahi, the majority of us have never experienced hunger. Not even one meal, except if we're fasting. And we know there's food in the fridge. We have never even experienced what it feels to be hungry and there is nothing to eat. And here is the Prophet of Allah ﷺ and his best companions Abu Bakr and Umar. And they are walking around with stones tied to their stomachs. They're walking around, they, can't, they don't have anything at all to eat. And as you know, the Prophet ﷺ was the leader of Arabia at that time. If he wanted to, he could live in the palaces of the kings and eat like, like the kings and princes do. So he came to the house of this companion. And he sat down to eat. Now can you imagine, my dear brothers and sisters, can you imagine? Here is the Prophet ﷺ coming to the house of this companion after having nothing to eat. Allah knows for how long, because remember, hunger of this nature will take maybe 12 to 20 hours or more. Maybe even two, three days without real food, heavy food. What do you think? Wallahi, and of any of us in this situation, he will think, okay, alhamdulillah, you know, Allah gave me some food. The last thing on his mind will be what the Prophet said. When he finished from his meal, he told Abu Bakr and Umar, I swear by Allah, on the day of judgment, You are going to be asked about these blessings. You left your houses hungry and you came back with your stomachs full. Allah will ask you about it. Look at how the Prophet is thinking. Look at what he is conscious of. As for us, we would rush to this food, eat until our stomachs are about to burst, and then just sit back and relax. Alhamdulillah, we have our food now. As we do in Ramadan, my dear brothers and sisters, let us be frank. As we do, Alhamdulillah, I fasted the day. Okay, now it's time to party. Astaghfirullah. Here is the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and some food comes to him, not even luxurious food, an old sheep or goat, 
along with maybe some dry crusty bread even if that was there and he is conscious of Allah and he reminds his companions Wallahi, I swear by Allah you will be asked on the day of judgment anil na'im regarding these blessings that you have been given my dear brothers and sisters if we wish to follow in the footsteps of the companions let us not forget that it is not just their aqidah it is not just their fiqh that we have to follow it is also their character their spirit their, their zuhd, their asceticism their closeness to Allah Azza wa Jal it is very easy to put a label on yourself that you are this and you are that and you boast and you look down at everyone else but wallahi thumma wallahi the majority of those people who have this boast they are the furthest from the salaf they are the furthest from the companions in terms of their ibadah in terms of their akhlaq in terms of their zuhd and asceticism of this world where is this? It is easy to follow these companions in aqidah. It is important, no doubt. It is easy to follow them in fiqh. And it is important, no doubt. But let us not forget that if you wish to ascribe yourself to the early generations, there is more to Islam than just this. Try to live a humble and modest life. No one is saying to be like this. We can't be like this. We can't give up the blessings that Allah has given us. It is difficult to. But let us not forget that there is another dimension of Islam that frankly is being very much neglected the spiritual dimension of Islam, the asceticism, the piety, the closeness to Allah, the worship of Allah Azza wa Jal. If we really and truly wish to follow the footsteps of the companions, let us take them as an entire picture and let us not pick and choose what is convenient for us to follow. With this I conclude my talk for today and I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal grants us ikhlas and sincerity and He grants us taqwa and khushu' and He makes us amongst those who are listening to, to the يَتَّبِعُونَ الْقَوْلَ فَيَتَّبِعُونَ الْقَوْلِ فَيَتَّبِعُونَ أَحْسَنَةً They listen to the remembrance and they follow it in the best of all ways. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَصَلَّى اللَّهُ وَسَلَمُ بَارَكَ الْعَبْدِهِ وَرَسُولِ مُحَمَّدِ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَسَلَمُ Okay, the question is basically that living in the West, our lifestyles are very different and that we have other, you know, firstly, we live a very luxurious lifestyle. This is a fact, all of us do. Okay, compared to the East, I mean, as you all know, uh, we're very painfully aware that, you know, America and England basically are the two major uh, consumers of everything, of energy and food and everything. And I think it's one American family consumes like the equivalent of 50 or 100 African families, something of this nature, one family. And we're amongst them as well. So we are guilty in this regard that we eat and consume and live far more lavishly than others. So uh, I want to, you wanted me to comment on that. Secondly, about savings. And what is the Islamic concept of saving some money for a rainy day? Okay. Um, well, firstly, my dear brothers and sisters, Allah Azza wa says, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah Azza wa will not call you to account for more than what you are capable of. Okay. And Allah Azza wa also said regarding the uh, story of Qarun. Now, who was Qarun? Who was Qarun? Qarun was the richest man of his time in the in the time of uh, the children of Israel. And Allah says in the Quran that the keys to his treasure chests, right, what does it say? Would be difficult for a group of strong men to carry. Just the keys, not the treasure chests themselves. You can imagine then he would have had, you know, thousands, thousands of keys to large boxes of gold and silver. He would probably be richer than Bill Gates of our times, if you converted it that, okay? So Allah Azza wa Jal tells him in the Quran that, وَبْتَغِي فِيمَا أَتَاكَ اللَّهُ أَدَّارَ الْآخِرَةَ وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا Beautiful verse. Use what we have given you to reach the hereafter, to reach Jannah, and don't forget your portion of this world. Okay? Your portion of this world. Notice how Allah Azza wa Jal phrases it. Use this money to gain the hereafter, but don't forget that you have this world to live in as well. But it's a portion. It's a piece of the pie and not the entire pie. It's a portion. And obviously, people will live according to how much Allah has given them. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah loves to see the effects of His blessings when He has blessed someone. If Allah has given you money, He doesn't like to see you dressed shabbily. You should be dressed the way that your money allows you. And if this money is halal, you're allowed to live according to the level of your, of your money. So if you are a multimillionaire, it is not required of you to live like the one who is lower than you. You can drive the cars that, that a multimillionaire would usually drive. And it is not showing off. Because showing off means to pretend to be above what you are. Okay? So if you are rich with halal money and you spend it on halal, you are not sinful, but you have gone a degree down. 
you have not reached the ideal. Okay? Many of the companions were rich, but they didn't let their money spoil them. None of the companions. Uthman ibn Affan was one of the richest companions. Abdurrahman ibn Auf as well. But they did not let their money spoil them. They would spend on themselves and their family and they would also spend for the sake of Allah Azza wa So, let us realize that Islam is the deen of moderation, is the religion of moderation. We are not required to all become, you know, like these companions. It's not possible. And in fact, none of us have and none of us could. We don't have that iman. So we live according to the means. If we earn X amount, we should live according to what that X amount should bring about. But the minimum, as we said, is that your earnings are halal and you spend it on zakah. You give your zakah. This is the minimum. If you don't fall beneath this, you are not sinful. But you have given up a lot of good that you could have possibly gained. Okay? So their excellence or the ideal, there is no limit. You can go on and on. And obviously the height is reached when Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he gives his entire money for the sake of the Prophet When the Prophet asks him, what have you left for your family? He says, I have left him Allah and his message. I have not a single penny left. Now this is the height of tawakkul and this is a separate, it's also a, you know, raises, raises some issues that we don't want to get into now. But obviously no one is saying, div, div, you know, give all of your money in sadaqah. This is not even asked of us. And in fact, the Prophet ﷺ, when Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas was about to die, the Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas said, I'm about to die and I have a large fortune. I want to give, you know, two thirds of it. The Prophet ﷺ said no. He said half of it, he said no. But then, then he said one third for sadaqah. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, one third and even a third is a lot. Even a third is a lot. And then he said, if you were to leave your dependents, your children rich and self-sufficient, they don't have to beg, it is better that you leave than you leaving them paupers and they have to beg people for money. So Allah Azza wa Jal does not require us to live to the Lies, Alhamdulillah. But there is a minimum. There is a minimum and that is the zakah. And anything more than this is recommended. Also with regards to savings, once again, Allah Azza wa Jal does not require us to spend everything we have on that day. The Prophet ﷺ himself would save up to one year's amount of grain in his house. Wheat, barley, you know, dried dates, up to one year. This is the Prophet ﷺ himself. So, and we're living in a time that it is only common sense that we take a portion of our salary and we put it in a halal investment. Make sure it's not haram, we don't get interest on it or something, this is haram. In a halal investment, this is a part of our iman. But let us not forget about the real investment of the hereafter. Let us also take a portion out of our savings and incomes and also use it for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal above and beyond what is required of us. So avoid the two extremes and live the type of life that Allah Azza wa Jal has, has asked you to live, which is a moderate life. You should live according to your means. To go beyond this is to be showing off. And the Prophet has cursed such people and Allah Azza wa Jal does not like them. To go beneath this, it is not required of you. And if you do so for the sake of Allah, it is rewarded. But it is not required of you, and you will not be held sinful for living according to the level that Allah has blessed you with. Inshallah. <laughs> there is a growing trend amongst practicing Muslims to compete against each other, especially in terms of extremely expensive cars. Outside the masjid is one example with a number plate, so and so, I don't want to mention the number plate. Okay, is this modesty? <laughs> Obviously, I, um, Allahu A'lam, yani, firstly, driving expensive cars, as I said, if it is of your means, and it is something that your money gives you the right to do if you like, then this is per completely permissible, and there is no set question of showing off. It is not expected for the multimillionaire to drive a 1984 Honda Civic, for example. Okay? It's just not expected. He is going to have a brand new Mercedes or Lexus or Jeep or whatever he has. And this is completely halal for him. However, the problem comes when you try to give the impression that you are richer than you are. And this is what is showing off. Showing off varies from person to person. It's not the same. For one person to drive a Lexus is not showing off. And for the, another person to drive the very same Lexus would be showing off. It all depends on your social status and your monetary uh, uh, incomes and savings. So with regards to the question, if the person is going beyond his means and trying to show off and boast, then this comes under showing off. And the, you know, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever tries to boast with his clothes or anything of this nature, Allah Azza wa will give him two garments of fire on the day of judgment. Okay? This is something that Allah does not like. You trying to show off. Who are you to show off? But if you wear the clothes that you're expected to wear, obviously the rich person will dress the way he is, he is expected to dress and this is not showing off. 
So it varies from person to person and culture to culture even, and time to time. If you look at the, the, the general acceptance amongst uh, the people, as long as it is within the uh, conditions of the Sharia, ah, for example, nothing haram is being done, then it is halal for the person to drive the best cars as long as it is of his means. With regards to the license plates, Allahu A'lam, yani, is this showing off or not, yani, to have these, uh, these cool license plates. Again, it goes back to the person and, and who he is, and Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. There is a hadith with regards to eating our food and how much we should eat. Would you please explain it? The hadith is that the Prophet ﷺ said, there's a number of hadith, I don't know which one the sister is referring to. There's one hadith that says that the believer eats in one stomach and the hypocrite eats in seven stomachs. Meaning that, you know, it is the hypocrite who stuffs himself every single time. You know, the believer, he, he eats modestly. Another hadith states that the Prophet ﷺ said that it is sufficient for a mu'min to eat a few morsels of food in order to keep his back straight. It is sufficient for a mu'min to eat a few morsels of food and that will keep his back straight. But if he must go beyond, then let him eat one third of his stomach space for food and one third for the water. Okay, and one third for the air that you breathe. Because the, the, as you know, even when you, when you fill yourself up, it becomes difficult to breathe even. Because that is a part of the, uh, the, the air, the, 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 the breathing process as well needs some of that space. Okay? So the process is that if you are going to fill yourself, then one third for his food, one third for his drink, and one third for his breath. So we should not stuff ourselves right to the limit. To do so goes against uh, yani the uh, height of piety and iman.